So yesterday we uh, began our discussion of the the physics of how to obtain a theory which describes the low energy physics from a theory which exists at high energy. And I gave you uh, a rather trivial example and that example consisted uh, of an action where in this action Q is the physical momenta in units of a momentum cutoff or the same as the physical in units of the inverse lattice spacing. This I will call the momentum space cutoff. And this is as I explained because of the restriction of the magnitude of momenta to lie between uh, Brillouin zones actually imply that a lattice spacing is roughly equivalent to a uh, cutoff of the momentum. And these were Fourier transforms of fields in Euclidean space. And it, the specific example of this function of Q square which we took was C0 plus C1 Q square and so on. And it is easy to convince yourself that this means uh, in moment in position space C0 phi square x plus C1 phi d square phi plus C2 phi d4 phi and so on. What I mean by d square phi is d mu d mu phi sum upon mu ranges from 1 to the number of dimensions which is d. Similarly, d4 is the square of this operator. The steps which we did following that is so the idea is so the partition function of the theory was product over all q between magnitude of q between 0 and 1 uh, minus s. <coughs> we then ask the question that can I write down another action which gives the exactly the same answer for correlators of phi which have momenta which have dimensionless momenta in terms of the original cutoff not all the way from 0 to 1 but say from 1 0 to 1 upon b. What that effectively means is that originally I had a theory on a lattice which is like this, this had a lattice spacing A. I want to ask can I invent another system whose lattice spacing is much bigger but which contains the same physics. But of course, the same physics means that I cannot ask questions in this theory at scales which are smaller than the lattice spacing of this theory. So therefore, if I measure a correlation function like that that would be the correlation function here. But if I measure a correlation function between two points like this that has no existence here. Okay. So, this is the meaning of the statement that I am reproducing the same low energy physics. It is low energy because it is low momentum, it is just a word, okay. long wavelength. We did two transformations because I changed the the, the here the lattice spacing of was A, here the lattice spacing was B times A. That means here if the cutoff was lambda, here the cutoff was lambda upon B. So we defined some, let me call it 
think it is tilde that is the physical momentum. We define a new momenta which are given by p times q b. We defined new fields <clears throat> p upon b that is the same as q and we derive just by plugging in whatever you got in this action and integrate. So, we, we integrated out all the fields between 0 and 1 upon b. So, we are left with uh, something uh, sorry between 1 upon b and 1. So, we are left with an integral between 0 and 1 upon b and this rescaling brings it back to the integral between 0 and 1. The physical meaning is that these are the momenta in units of the new cutoff of the theory. And we derived that the new action I will call S prime has exactly the same form as the original action <coughs> P with C 0 prime plus C 1 prime P square plus C 2 prime P fourth and so on with psi of P and psi of minus P. And by choice we had C 0 prime is B square C 0, C 1 prime equal to C 1, C 2 prime equal to B to the minus C 2 and so on. Then we said that what these relationships mean is that if I keep doing this operation over and over again, then the effective value of C 0 which is the value of C 0 of this low energy theory keeps increasing while the effective value of C 1 remains the same effective value of C 2 uh, decreases and therefore, at, at very very low energies I mean all you really have is a theory which has a C 1 which is non 0 and C 0 which is non 0 everything else just goes away. So, let me make this let me just make two comments. The first comment is that I actually did a very simple thing in a very difficult way. The very simple thing is as follows. I sort of hid it very carefully so that you do not recognize the simplicity of the whole thing. All I did was dimensional analysis I mean the chapter 1 of the first physics textbook which you have ever read. And the way it works is as follows you take this form of the action. All I did was to ensure that this action has to be dimensionless, it has to be dimensionless, otherwise, it does not make sense of writing e to the minus s, right. You can only take exponential of a dimensionless object, ok. This measure has dimension d times dimensions of length, it is conventional in this field to measure. So, I should say that I am using h bar equal to c equal to 1 units. So, the dimension of momenta is the inverse of dimension of length a dimension of x and we usually when you say the dimension we actually mean or so moment has the same dimension as mass. This follows for example, from Heisenberg uncertainty relation because delta p delta x has to be 1 since h bar is 1. This follows from Einstein's e equal to m c square because c is 1 energies has to have the same units as, uh, as the momentum itself. So, that also x to the minus 1. So, the dimension when I when I will call a dimension of anything what I mean is a like a mass dimension. And what I mean is in if I take this expression <clears throat> then this term here has a mass dimension which is minus d ok. So, let us do one by one all the terms. 
Now, how do I know what is the dimension of these terms? I have to decide how to do it and I have to decide what dimension do I ascribe to the field phi. That object phi have, must carry some dimension. The choice that I did this is equivalent to the choice that I declare C1 to be dimensionless. What that means is it is very easy to see that the dimension of phi has to be d minus 2 by 2. Let us check that. So, there are 2 phi's here that gives d minus 2. There are 2 derivatives. So, another plus 2 because it is 2 d d x downstairs. So, that gives a d mass dimension d. This gives a mass dimension minus d. So, the whole thing cancels and become dimensionless. Once I decide on that, so the dimension of phi square is d minus 2. So, the dimension of C 0 has to be 2. Okay. The dimension of C 2, so let us look at the dimension of C 2. The dimension of this thing is d minus 2 by 2, 2 times d minus 2 by 2 plus 4. So, that is d minus that is equal to d plus 2. The, the dimension of this is uh, mark. No, plus 4 because there are two 4 derivatives d d x to the power 4. So, is counting mass dimension. The dimension of d is this. So, that tells you dimension of C 2 has to be d plus 2. I got something wrong here. D yeah, d minus 2 plus 2. So, I have to add find out whatever it is. So, it's, it has to be minus 2 because you have to add d minus 2 minus 2 should be give equal to d. And similarly, dimension of C 4 is minus 4 and so on and so forth. Okay. And then what you realize is that this scaling is nothing but <coughs> r by lambda square where lambda is the momentum case cut off. So, this immediately sorry r times lambda square same as r upon a square. So, then r is a dimensionless sorry r by lambda square. So, therefore, C 0 oh, notation is getting confused here let it r 0 by lambda square. So, uh, what did I do? C 0 is dimension sorry. So, r 0 is dimensionless. Okay. And then what I said is that if I keep the dimensional objects the same, namely in the RG transformation, <coughs> lambda going to lambda upon B, so the lambda keeps decreasing, I want to keep the C 0 the same that requires that r 0 has to go times beta times r 0. I have to change notation a little bit because these have dimensions. Sorry. So, sorry. Sorry for the notation. This was your original, uh, original C 0. <coughs> okay. Now, I have everything in control. The things with the tildes are in position space what I have written down. And the things which correspond to those C 0, C 1, C 2 are related like C 1 tilde is C 1, C 2 tilde is C 2 by lambda square and so on. <coughs> okay. Similarly, if I want to keep C 2 fixed, then C 2. 
so this is c is 0 again should go to b to the minus 2 c by exactly the same reason. What does this mean? <coughs> this means the following. <coughs> okay. And in our case, those recursion relations are C n prime is equal to C n times B raised to the power 2 1 minus n. <coughs> so, C 0 prime is B square times C 0, C 1 is the same, C 1 prime is the same as C 1 and so on and so forth. Okay. Given this recursion relations, one defines a notion of what is called a fixed point. The fixed point of an RG transformation means that values of C n are such that C n prime is equal to C n for all n. Okay. So, let us see what is the fixed point of this transformation. For these transformations means uh, C 0 equal to C 2 equal to C 4 everything equal to 0, but C 1 is arbitrary. If I draw a picture in, in the space of coupling, so let me draw just a two dimensional version of it with C 0 and C 2 of it, the fixed point is this point out here. If I ask what is the action of the theory at the fixed point, that action <coughs> is simply given by A s equal to C 1 integral d 5 whole square and nobody determines what C 1 is. This represents the action of what is called a massless scalar field theory. It is called massless scalar field theory because if you calculate the correlation function of phi, <coughs> so if I calculate, so this integral and I so leave as an exercise, let us say half C 1 integral, I write in momentum space. <coughs> d d p p square phi p phi minus p what you find is phi of p 1 phi of p 2 ok. Why is this massless? Because if I take the Fourier transform of this, say p 1. So, since it is only non 0 for p 1 equal to minus p 2, I will just write it like that d to the i p x. So, this is integral sorry d d p So, this clearly scales as 1 upon x raised to the power d minus 2. On the other hand, if there was a non zero c z, non zero c 0, so that I had an action which was plus c 0 phi of p phi of minus p, then this would be replaced by c 0 plus this like this and just by using, so this will be some c 0 
times modulus of x. This is the famous Yukawa law for force between for potential between two objects which have a exponential decay and it in we call it a massless particle because what Yukawa invented was the notion that physical forces are caused by exchange of particles and in this case it is an exchange of a massive particle a uh, exchange of a particle of a mass given by C naught whereas in this case it is an exchange when you have just p square you have an exchange of a particle which is massless. Okay. Another reason why this is called massless this is an Euclidean theory so there is really nothing like an energy or a momentum but if you analytically continue this to normal Lorentzian signature this action in, in momentum space would have become d omega d d minus 1 p omega square minus p square phi of p phi minus p. So, the this action the on shell thing of this action is omega square equal to p square which is the relativistic dispersion relation for a massless particle. So, the fixed point describes uh, an action which corresponds to a massless field physically what this means is that the correlation function in real space is a power law. Let me erase that C naught for the moment. So, this is just a power law this thing is not there we call it a long range correlation or the correlation length which was defined as that thing in the exponent is actually infinite. Okay. So, what we want to ask is that for a given point in theory space I have a given value of C 0 and C 2 and I can calculate uh, using whatever for the, the particular action what the correlation function of that theory is I can write it down what this entire process of an RG transformation tells you that for correlation functions which momenta which are small I can equivalently calculate the same thing by another theory which is a different C0 and a different C2 which is represented by this point. Okay. This and you can imagine I did a discrete transformation of the lattice spacing going times b times the lattice spacing b was a number bigger than 1, but I can imagine taking b to be a number very very close to 1, but still bigger than 1 in which case this will be an infinitesimal transformation that is what we call an infinitesimal renormalization group transformation. <coughs> so, under RG trajectory is the locus of points in theory space which are related by a RG transformation. <coughs> Just from this formula, this one formula in this particular case it is not very hard to see that the trajectories sort of look like this. This is one trajectory, this is another trajectory and this is another trajectory. I leave it as an exercise for you to figure out why the picture looks like this. You can also figure out that these things never cross each other. Okay. I also put an arrow on each of this which tells you that this is the direction of the RG transformation. What that means is as I go along this direction 
I describe effective theories at longer and longer distances. Okay, so smaller and smaller momentum. There's something remarkable about this, about this picture. So let me try to emphasize what is remarkable about this picture. Suppose at some cutoff, some with a theory, with some cutoff, lambda, which is given, for example, uh, I just give you an example, like there is always d phi square and then let me write down some c 0 phi square and what do you want me to write down? I, wa I want to write down an equation which is sort of like this and a c 2 phi fourth where c 0 c 2 lie on a line which is that this line. For example, if, if I drew the line same, it would correspond to having the same value of C2 and different values of, of same value of C2, but different values of C0. Okay? So, each point on this line corresponds to some theory with some value of C0 and some value of C2. And I say that I take this theory, theory number 1 <clears throat> and you do whatever calculations you want to do. In this case, the only calculation basically you can do is a two-point correlation function. This is just an example. Okay? And you can calculate the two-point function at momenta which are much, much smaller than the cutoff. Remember the discussion yesterday we are interested in the physics which are which are momentum scale much lower than the cutoff we are not interested in the physics at the cutoff scale you can take whatever you have by calculating this theory and just substitute those value of the momentum but what this entire entire structure and entire framework of rg transformations tell you is that you might as well calculate in another theory which lies here. The reason being this theory and that theory has exactly the same long distance physics. Okay? Or a theory which is further up down, up there. Okay? And you are guaranteed to get the same answer. These are two theories with two different values of C0 and C2 related by this formula which give you, gives rise to the same physics. And then you notice as your beginning point came, comes closer and closer to this axis with C0 equal to 0, something very special happens. This trajectory sort of creeps along this and basically runs along the along the y axis so what this is telling you is that regardless of what the value of c2 is in this theory that information is completely lost by the time you have we have performed a large number of rg transformations because the physics is completely equivalent to a set of theories which basically have C2 extremely small, close to 0. Okay? This is the sense in which C2 is an example of an irrelevant operator, irrelevant coupling. So that was the reason C0 was a relevant coupling and C2, C4 were right, irrelevant couplings. And the
the lesson we want to draw from all this is that the low energy physics <coughs> is entirely given by the relevant coupling symmetry. <coughs> In this example, yes. So, suppose I have an action, I will write the action as an integral, let me even write in position space and yes, I will introduce some terminology, G i are called, I will call couplings, let us say 0 to infinity, I mean I have all kinds of things in it, O i, I will call operators. Now, I should, I should specify we are doing classical statistical mechanics. So, these are not operators in the sense of operators in Hilbert space, though when using the transfer matrix when I relate it some quantum mechanics they do become operators in Hilbert space, but the this nevertheless call operators. So, examples of O i where phi square d phi whole square phi d 4 phi but now I am also going to consider phi 4, phi 6, so on and so forth. Okay? <clears throat> I have chosen pretty much like the examples I have given before G i to be dimensionless. Let me try to specify what that means. For example, I can have an O i which is phi fourth. So, I have a term in the action which is d 4 x, some g, I call it something g times phi fourth. Okay. The dimension of phi was d minus 2 by 2 and from here you can calculate that the dimension of g is going to be, so, so dimension of G has to be dimension of G plus 2 times D minus 2 has to be equal to D. So, dimension of G is equal to 4 minus. Okay. So, so let me call this G tilde, that is the dimension of G tilde. So, the dimensionless coupling G I will define as G divided by lambda to the power 4 minus T. <coughs> Pretty much like all those relations between C tilde and C. I will always talk in terms of dimension this couplings. Okay. Yeah. Any question? Very soon I will in fact relax even this condition that it has to be some power of b, it could be some function of b, which I will determine, uh, which depends from theory to theory times phi. And the result of all this is that I get a new action, which is g i prime o i and the g i prime are related <coughs> is some function of all the other coupling CJ. I keep it completely general. Yeah. No. So, what I have done is, so I whatever powers of lambda are there, I will absorb in the O i. Okay. I will just only totally talk about these G i's which are dimension. Okay. So, this is the way the coupling, these are the recursion relations <coughs> D 
these examples were very simple versions of these recursion relations where you take each coupling it just went as b to the raised to the some power times other coupling. I will now allow for something completely general. It could be so general for example, if there were three couplings I could have g2 prime is some function of g1, g2, g3 whatever does not matter some general function of this thing because I wanted to show the generality of the thing. A fixed point is a point which is g i star such that g i star prime is the same as g i that is the definition of a fixed point. Okay. This relationship between the new coupling g i and the old coupling g j can be horribly nonlinear. Okay. It can be any, anything you like. Nevertheless, if I look close to the fixed point, <coughs> and I define a departure from the fixed point as g i minus g i star, then it is quite clear I can and consider delta g i to be very small, then I can rewrite this recursion relation by a Taylor series expansion around g i star and obtain a recursion relation which is linear and let me call this a matrix L i j times g j uh, a sum upon j I am using Einstein convention that whenever I have a repeated index I sum upon the index. Okay? So, if there are like 25 couplings L i j is a 25 times 25 matrix which acts on a column vector which I write as the couplings. Is this notation clear? Right. Okay. Now, it could be that I end up with a matrix which cannot be diagonalized, but I will assume my transformations of the form that the matrix can be diagonalized. <coughs> so, so what I do? I diagonalize the matrix Once I diagonalize the matrix, <coughs> I know that the eigenvalues have the form which I call uh, say m i, these are the eigenvalues have to be of the form b raised to the some number y i. And the reason for this is <coughs> that this is the eigenvalue. See, so if I this is the eigenvalue for one, you know, what I have done here is a one step of an RG by a factor of G B. But I suppose I repeat it many, 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 many times. So that means that I will keep getting delta G I prime is L I J delta G J, and then I delta G I double prime is the same matrix time delta g prime and so this matrix must have the property that these eigenvalues must have the property that this with a given b raised to the power n <coughs> has to be the same thing as b raised to the power n. It has to be that way because if I were able to diagonalize right in the first step it would go so say b to the y 1 next time it will go b to the 2 y 1 that is the same as b square raised to the y 1. Okay. <clears throat> the eigenvectors of this matrix I will call <coughs> delta h i. So, that means 
that delta h i prime is b raised to the power y i times delta h i. In the example which I started discussing yesterday, this was automatic. We already had a basis of these operators where this was true. What I am trying to impress upon you now that this is not generally, if I just write some set of operators, it is not guaranteed that this matrix will be diagonal. So, you have to go to a basis where the matrix is in fact diagonal. log of the partition function remains the same. <coughs> but the free energy density therefore changes, where free energy density I, I mean free energy divided by the number of sites, because everything is measured in units of the of the lattice spacing, because the number of sites have gone down, right? Because you have changed the lattice spacing from A to say 2 times A, right? And a little thought makes it clear that generally the free energy <coughs> for the new thing has to be B raised to the power D times the free energy of the old thing. I will write this in the opposite way. This b to the d just it reflects the fact that you have changed the lattice spacing from a to b times a. So, that means f of g i is b to the minus d f of g i prime <coughs> and near fixed point this means f of delta h i is b to the minus d f of delta h i prime which is b to the y i delta h i. <coughs> and so far I have assumed that this is true for any arbitrary b provided this linearized approximation holds. Okay? <coughs> Since this relationship is valid for any b, I do have a freedom of choosing any b I like. So, let us make a clever choice. <coughs> Suppose is a relevant coupling that is y of k is bigger than 0. Remember relevant couplings were defined as things where with they were b raised to some positive number. <coughs> there could be many relevant couplings. I just chosen one of them labeled it by k and called it delta h k. it is an eigenvector in the coupling space. So, that is also a coupling. Yeah. And I choose b to the power y k equal to 1. I said this is valid for any b. I can choose any b I like. So, I choose b to be like this. So, let us see what happens. So, that means B is delta H k to the power minus 1 upon y k and therefore, this relationship becomes delta H i is equal to times D by y k times the free energy. So, this free energy is a function this free energy is a function of g 1, g 2, 
G1 prime, G2 prime, G3 prime, and so on, right? So this will be a function of delta H i and so this contains i not equal to k and the term with i equal to k was by definition 1. Just to if this is a bit too abstract, let us take two couplings delta h1 and delta h2. This has y1 negative, let us this have y2 uh, positive and I choose b to be delta h2 raised to the power 1, one minus y2. Okay. So, this relationship then becomes delta h1 delta h2 is given by delta h2 raised to the power d by y2 same function delta h1 minus y1 by y2 and 1. Is this clear? The scaling relation? This is an example of what we call a scaling relation. I have not done anything non trivial. All I have done is use the recursion relation and cleverly chosen a B such that it just becomes of this form. But now I will do something a little bit non trivial. Notice one thing. as goes to 0 with some delta h i any finite <coughs> then if for a given y if y i is negative, this power here will be like for example, okay. so, so then delta h i delta h k that goes to 0 because y i is negative and delta h k is small. However, if y i is positive, this remains. Okay. So, this relationship tells you that the free energy density in the limit when delta h k is very small only depends on the relevant couplings of the theory. Okay. Why did it happen? And I want to describe the free energy of the theory for some value of delta H1 and delta H2 which corresponds to this point. Okay. As this point comes closer and closer then by an RG transformation the low energy physics is entirely given by that point. And that point does not have any knowledge about delta H1. Right? So, regardless of what value of delta H1 I started out to be, as I go to the limit that delta H2 is small, then all dependence on delta H1 goes away. Okay? Good? Okay. Let us do this very specifically for two couplings delta H1 and delta H2. Just remember. <coughs> hmm? <coughs> so, 
the correlation length in physical units is the distance over which things are correlated. Okay, if I take this system, it has a correlation length which is actually quite small. I mean things are pretty closely correlated. Okay. But whatever it is given a system, it is some correlation length some let us say 10 centimeters. Okay. <laughs> so, if I think of that system with a physical correlation length 10 centimeters and put it on a lattice whose lattice spacing is one angstrom for example, I can define a dimension less correlation length which is the one which we are considering. So, if the correlation length I will call it psi physical and then dimension less correlation length. Xi is xi physical divided by lattice spacing or xi physical multiplied by the momentum space cutoff. <coughs> okay. As the lattice spacing becomes larger because in, in my new system I have gone from a system of lattice spacing A to a lattice spacing B times A, right. It is clear that this dimension less correlation length is reduced by a factor of B if the physical correlation length is the same. I am going to describe this object, it has some correlation length 10 centimeters, I can never change that. It is my description which can change. In the first description with the uh, lattice spacing of one angstrom, right. So, then the correlation length is 10 to the power 9 dimension less correlation length, right. If I have, if I now describe the same system by putting on a lattice which is 2 times the lat, 2 times 2 angstroms, then the dimension less correlation length is 0 0.5 times 10 to the power 9 dimensionless correlation then decreases as I do an RG transformation. So, I can write a recursion relation for the dimensionless correlation length which looks like or it, it should I should really start writing it like this and then I take This relationship is quite similar to the kind of thing I wrote down for just for the free energy. And by exactly the same logic which will be an exercise for you, you can show is once again given by if you want we can do this in the tutorial. What does this show? This shows that since by definition the, the coupling labeled by k is a relevant coupling that means y k is positive. So, this exponent is negative. So, therefore, this shows that as delta h k goes to 0, the dimensionless correlation then goes to infinity. So, this we what we call is a critical theory, a critical theory which has the correlation then so large that it has really long range correlations. But this tells you something interesting in terms of this picture. This tells you that all these points everywhere here the correlation length must be infinity. Because under an RG transformation, the correlation length 
always decreases, right? And at the fixed point, clearly the correlation length is infinity because the theory is scaling invariant as we showed yesterday, right? So, the nature of the flows clearly states that if I start from a point here, it is just going to flow like that. Therefore, the beginning point must also have been finished correlation length. This point clear? In general, if I have a theory, then there will always be an infinite number of irrelevant couplings because you can write an infinite number of things in terms of phi's, whatever you like. Almost all of them, almost all of them are irrelevant couplings. So, this picture I should draw like this, like delta H2, delta H3, delta H4, no delta H, sorry, 3, 4, 5, all the pictures are like that and this entire surface here, if I take all the pictures are like that and this entire surface here, if I take any point on this surface, it is going to have a correlation length equal to infinity. Because of this, this surface has a name, it is called a critical surface. Okay. Good. <clears throat> now, let me come back to the question which I started asking yesterday. The question which I started asking yesterday is that how do I con understand a low energy theory with some dimensionful quantities? A theory, for example, which describes a particle of some mass, you know, say an electron or a proton or, or what have you in the theory. <coughs> in terms of a theory which is intrinsically de defined in terms of a cutoff, the property being that the masses, the energies, and everything I am considering in this physical theory have to be much, much smaller than the cutoff. <coughs> For example, if I m is the mass, physical mass <coughs> of a particle I want to describe, then by the connection between statistical mechanics and quantum mechanics which I discussed yesterday, this corresponds to a physical correlation length which is equal to 1 upon m physics in the statistical system <laughs> and therefore, uh, uh, a dimension less correlation length which is m physical by a as 1 times m physical times a. I can call it 1 times the dimension less mass and what this tells you is that if I am to consider a theory where m physical is much, much less compared to the inverse lattice spacing which is the momentum space cutoff of the theory. M naught is a number which is much, much smaller, smaller than 1. The discussion I did for M physical would appear to all relevant couplings in the theory. So, if I want to describe a theory which has some fixed physical values of relevant couplings, then I should consider a statistical system where the dimension less values of these things are actually small or depending on whether you consider mass or the correlation length uh, to be infinite. <coughs> so, 
this tells you that effective field theories sometimes they are called continuum limits they correspond to some given values of relevant couplings I am regarding mass also as a coupling means that the statistical mechanical system <coughs> is close to the critical surface. Again in terms of this picture let me get rid of the higher dimensional surface. <coughs> If I consider a point on this, it corresponds to some theory which a very small value of the relevant coupling, but a dimensionless relevant coupling is very small. Okay? So, that small value of a relevant coupling as I flow down using an RG transformation becomes equivalent to a fairly large value of the relevant coupling, but the lattice facing is also very large now compared to this lattice facing because I have done a lot of RG transformations. So, what this corresponds to is that if I choose the dimensional value of the relevant coupling to be fixed, then I can adjust this thing in such a way that I arrive at this point. Okay. This is precisely that statement. I give you the value of mass m physical a pi on of mass 140 MeV and I tell you tell me the lattice system which is going to describe for me that and the lattice system will describe which I will write down in order to describe a pi on of mass 140 MeV is going to have a dimensionless mass which is tiny, 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 small. <laughs> okay? But however, as we just argued, this is not the only theory that is going to give you that. I could have started with another theory which is here, which has a different value of the irrelevant coupling. Right. So, it will also after a while flow to along exactly the same trajectory okay, because it is all on the same trajectory. So, this just tells you I can start with the theory with you know very different values of the irrelevant couplings, but I still get in the low energy physics the physics which is determined by the relevant couplings. Now, you can easily see that if I have theories where the number of relevant couplings are finite, all I have to do is to adjust the finite number of quantities in the theory. I do not care about all the infinite number of irrelevant couplings and this is exactly the reason why physics works. This is exactly the reason why the details of the high energy theory which are encoded in the values of this irrelevant couplings are actually irrelevant to the low energy physics. There are only few of the details which remain in the low energy physics. Quantum critical center. Okay. Yeah. the correlation length as a function of this thing of the uh, of the relevant coupling. I will I'll give let me just just hold on a minute I will give you the concrete example of that. Yeah. 
no, no, just, just hold on a second, just give me a minute. So let us apply this to magnets. <coughs> So normal magnets the field phi corresponds to magnetization okay and it turns out that there are two relevant couplings in the theory one is a temperature and the other is a magnetic field. and the other is a magnetic field. <coughs> of course, if I write down a theory of a magnet, it has all kinds of things in it. Okay? I mean you can you can write down a I do not know a Ising model with nearest neighbor coupling, Ising model with next to nearest neighbor coupling, can you know write down lattices which are square, you can write down lattices which are what are called bipartite lattices, all kinds of things. You know, if you are a condensed matter physicist, you can go mad with all kinds of details of you know, Hamiltonian <laughs> Hamiltonians which you can describe to form a magnet. But then why is it that the critical behavior of magnet near the Curie temperature is so simple and the reason why the critical behavior is so simple is because there are only two relevant couplings okay? and it turns out that this one has a y which corresponds to half. So if I put a magnet in a zero magnetic field I should get uh, a relationship which is <coughs> let me see it's t minus t c so the okay so let me not consider it to be half so this has some y which I'll call y t then this would depend on the <coughs> the fixed point of this system has t equal to t c and all, all other couplings <coughs> at some specific values. Just to give an example, what I will start with an Ising model, right, which is some S i S j with nearest neighbor couplings, right. Think of these as lying on a lattice. Of, and in the Ising model, then clearly if you write this thing down, this will become you know uh, the first nearest neighbor thing in, in when I write in a continuum notation, it will have d s whole square, but then it will also have d s whole four because as, as you keep as you make a discrete difference in terms of derivatives, in terms of the Taylor series, or you get all kinds of things in it, not d s to the power 4, but d square s whole square and d 4 s whole square, it has everything in it, right. This is a theory which I have written down which has specified values for all the irrelevant, these are all irrelevant couplings in the theory, okay. It will also have a term which is a square. And as we will see, the only thing that matters is the value of this thing S square, okay. And that corresponds to the temperature of the theory. And if you calc, so given this y t, you can easily show that this will go as t minus t c raised to the power d upon y t. <coughs> so as t goes to t c in the limit, So what this tells you is that as I go to the critical temperature, regardless of whether I start this or the next nearest neighbor S i S j or you know what have you, does not matter what you start out with it, the only thing that matters is T minus T c. And 
this number which sits here which in, in usual magnets turned out to be just half has nothing to do with the details of the microscopic nature of the model, but it has got to do with the properties of the flow of the relevant couplings on an RG transformation. Okay. <clears throat> this statement has a name and it explains something extremely deep about critical phenomena. It is called universality. Universe. What this means is that, that the critical behavior of systems are universal, they are independent of most of the details of the microscopic nature of the system, uh, microscopic nature of the sample. And if I take a magnet made out of nickel or a magnet made out of iron, they will have the same kind of behavior of, of this, these things are called exponents, the same kind of the way the correlation link diverges, the way the free energy behaves, the way the susceptibility diverges, it does not depend on what you consider it. Even more remarkably, the critical exponents which are, which appear in something like a liquid gas transition which has nothing to do with magnets also have a similar kind of values and exactly the similar values like half and one third or whatever which you are probably familiar with probably course in statistical mechanics. This explains why this is so. At the same time it explains, it, it lets us understand that this notion that the emergence of universal behavior near critical points is ultimately the reason why quantum field theory makes sense because quantum field theory is quantum mechanics which is defined on the continuum where there are infinite number of points where the lattice spacing is very small and we have gotten rid of that. But in physical terms it just means we are looking at phenomena far far below the cutoff and this is the, the universality therefore means that pretty much the low energy theory is independent of many of the most of the details of the high energy high energy theory only few of those numbers trickle down to low energies and give you the physical behavior okay this is why we are able to do physics after all but given the fact i am almost up okay <clears throat> Let me then set up the problem, I would not be able to do the ex epsilon expansion as I tried to do. Uh, maybe I, I complete this discussion by a derivation of what are called uh, renormalization group equations for Green's functions. <clears throat> I should actually explain to you why this thing is at all called renormalization group. Why is it, why does the word renorm, there is no renormalization anywhere here coming here. The reason why it is called renormalization group is as follows. Huh? It is changing, but what, what is renormalized? Computing, independent of all this. Things like correlation functions, say phi of p, phi of minus p in interacting quantum field theories. Okay? And what they found are typically integrals. I mean, for example, let me give you an example of this. A real example of this is uh, it would introduce an integral ddq. <coughs> Q square plus m square, okay, and then there would be let me the whole answer. I'll, I'll I'll not tell you where this comes from, but I'll just write down what the answer is.
function and integral those phi's I have written down. Okay. This is an answer uh, for this integral, uh, an approximation for the answer of this integral. A uh, guardian position space. This and for phi of t, phi of minus t divided by the partition function named which does not have the phi's. It is just result of integration of this thing. Okay. This is interpreted as a quantum mechanical two point function of the corresponding operator, but regardless of what that is, what that comes up with. <coughs> In terms of Feynman diagrams, if you are familiar with it, it represented by this something like this. Okay. And there were been you know, a lots of diagrams like this and people tried to calculate it and of course, the notion was that uh, these are fields which live in continuous space time. So, this momenta ran from 0 to lambda and as you can see for example, in d equal to 4 this thing is divergent from as lambda goes to infinity because there are 4 powers of q downstairs and 2 powers of q uh, upstairs and 2 powers of q downstairs. So, this will diverge as lambda squared in fact, it is easy to see that. This is one example of divergences which arrived by a naive calculation in quantum field theory. And so, people were confused about this for a while, for a long time. So, what to do about this? They said, okay, let us take this action and you add something which are called counter terms such that the divergences are cancelled. So, there will be a new contribution to this plus contribution to counter terms <coughs> new contribution uh, which such that this divergence is cancelled and you get a finite answer. This is the process which was called renormalization, it is like you renormalize your quantities. <coughs> In the modern way of understanding this, there is nothing funny going on really. What is going on here is that again you you know draw a picture like this and for example, uh, <clears throat> I mean one of the things which you can read out from the two point function is the pole of the Green's functions gives the mass of the particle. So, this will change that pole a little bit by an infinite amount. In the new way of thinking about it, so what you are doing is that in the theory with a cutoff, there is some theory out here, you want to describe a physical theory with a finite value of the mass. Okay. And as we just learned that in order to be able to do that, you should start out with a theory, a statistical mechanical system which has a very large dimensionless correlation length something which is very close to the critical surface. And as you would probably know if you are dealing with a system with uh, which has a large correlation length, it is very bad to calculate things in that system. Because you know the correlation length is very large it induces large range correlations and everything which you try to compute seems to have large corrections. If you are a very practical minded person and suppose I was say that I write a computer program to calculate something in a system which has large correlation length, you immediately realize that you have to take a box which is huge, I mean larger and larger and larger it become practically impossible. But then Wilson tells you there is an alternative way of thinking about the problem by not computing the thing in your original system which had a large correlation length, but computing in a system which is related by, by, by an RG transformation to this one. This action has a different form from what you started out with, but still related to this. But here the correlation length is finite, because the correlation length keeps decreasing after RG transformations. Okay. If the correlation length is finite, then it is easy to do a calculation and you should not encounter any, any divergent behavior of any kind. 
in the old language, the mass which was associated with this theory was what would you call or the parameters associated with that theory are what you would call bare parameters. And this process of integrating out the, the higher momentum and obtaining an effective theory at some low momentum scale, it changes the values of those parameters and the new values of these parameters are called renormalized parameters. Okay. So, at some low energy scale which is some 10 TeV or something, this will have some physical values of parameters which are completely finite, there is nothing wrong with it, I have just explicitly shown that everything would be completely finite in that theory. Of course, if you start bang on the critical surface as a different story, you are never going to flow to here. If I start on the critical surface, you are going to flow to the fixed point of the theory. That theory is very different from what, what, a, what a massive theory is. Okay, this theory is an example of what is called a conformal field theory. But the nevertheless, this whole point of writing down something and then making a subtraction is in fact completely equivalent to exactly doing this procedure. Okay? When we do some explicit examples, it will become quite clear to you that why this thing actually works. In fact, I will do some exactly solvable examples in field theory which illustrates how we should adjust the values of the bare parameters such that you, the values of the renormalized or the physical parameters are what you wish. Okay. I will just take two more minutes to introduce a, a few definitions and then I will quit. Okay. A generalization of this discussion, so let me formalize the discussion which I did. <clears throat> by writing down, so we wrote down recursion relations for the free energy, recursion relations for the correlation length, obviously you can write down recursion relations for correlation functions or Green's functions in the theory. And those recursion relations would look like this. So, let me consider a, say a correlation function which is like phi of x and phi of 0 defined according to the functional and integral and call that this is some operator A, uh, some let us just write phi phi okay, and call that g of x. In a given theory, this is clearly a function of the couplings. So, in the, in the cutoff theory, there is some dependence on the couplings. So, clearly, I can write down a recursion relation which is quite general and let me try to explain what I mean by that. These are all the couplings in the theory. This right hand side is that is the analog forget about this part. Okay. So, this part all what I have done is replace x by x upon b basically change the lattice spacing from a to b times a. Okay. That results in changing the coupling g i to g i prime. So, that is understood. This factor z was the factor of b raised to the some power which I used in my examples. I have just taken uh, a more general case where this overall factor this is the this is a factor depending on b which I have to redefine my fields in order to the renormalization group transformation. But in general theories, it will also depend on the couplings. In the example which I did, it did not depend on the coupling. General theories, it does. So, I have written a general function of G and B. Okay. <coughs> and suppose I make an infinitesimal transformation. <coughs> b is 1 plus e. So, then you can easily write is equal to
sorry. All I have done, I have everywhere there is a b there, I put b equal to 1 plus epsilon and then expand it to linear order in epsilon. This term comes because b is in the downstairs, so by Taylor series there will be a derivative of g with respect to x. This term comes because g depends on g, uh, capital G small g. So, this is the variation which is induced by because g i prime depends on g i by some other recursion relations which depend on b. So, this term captures that and this term captures the fact that this overall thing of course, depends on epsilon okay, plus order epsilon square. <coughs> So, this gives you an equation which is called a beta function. This tells you how the couplings change under an infinitesimal renormalization group transformation. This equation is a differential equation satisfied by any Green's function in the theory and it has two objects or I should define what lambda is. <coughs> okay. Not yet. No. Not yet. It is because it is a d d x, it will become a Kalan Samans equation after a, after a few changes, I will not do that at the moment. But this tells you something which you already knew that at a fixed point beta i is equal to 0 and therefore, g goes as 1 upon x raised to the power lambda. So, that is a power law. It tells you when beta i is not equal to 0, it tells you the, tells you the corrections to this power law. Okay. This is an example of uh, a lot, uh, a class of equations uh, which are called renormalization group equations, you know Kalan Simansic equation is one of those. I think I think I'll just stop here. We'll, uh, so this defines for you the beta functions, and one of the aims in this entire subject is to calculate beta functions. Okay.